Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Inside the Issue, as today we talk about the management of metastatic urothelial bladder cancer. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Terrence Friedlander from the Helen Dillard Family Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Petros Grievous uh, from the University of Washington Fred Hutchison Cancer Center in Seattle. We also have some other investigators uh, who are participating in this program who completed a survey that we're going to show you during this webinar, and we thank them very much for their participation. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room, and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As always, we have a one-minute quick uh, pre- and post uh, a survey for you to take. Uh, if you do that, we'll learn a little bit more about you, and you'll get a lot more out of this conference. We do webinars all the time. Next week, we're doing one specifically for oncology nurses, a follow-up to the Oncology Nursing Society, a meeting that we went to a few weeks ago. We'll be talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, well, then we have a great uh, program on July 11th, uh, looking at uh, high-risk MDS. A lot of really new, interesting, uh, challenging uh, things, uh, new developments going on there. And then on July 13th, a really interesting program on dermatologic cancer, cancers including melanoma, and I'm going to tell you a little story about one of the studies we're going to talk about there before we get started here. We're doing another program on myeloma and bispecific antibodies on July the 18th, and then ASCO was uh, super uh, hot in terms of ER-positive breast cancer, so we're going to dive into that on uh, July the 20th. Uh, we're going to also continue our soft tissue sarcoma series, and we'll be doing a program on uh, July 25th there. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars uh, when they're cars and driving. If you're into uh, audio podcasts, check out our Oncology Today uh, series, including a recent program with uh, Dr. Tagawa on uh, metastatic uh, uh, bladder cancer that we're going to be talking about tonight. So I met with both faculty members in the last couple weeks to record an in-depth presentation for both of them. These are the title slide. Dr. Friedlander reviewed uh, immunotherapy-based strategies in the metastatic setting. Dr. Grievous talked about second-line therapy and novel uh, new developments, including anti-HER therapy, which uh, I think you're going to find really interesting. Uh, those uh, links to those presentations are in the chat room, and we'll also be sending that out by email along with the replay of this program. But what we're going to do here tonight is sort of try to take it to the next level and introduce the findings of a survey we did of our faculty of their usual treatment practices. Here are the papers that are reviewed in these programs. And again, uh, if you want to get all the details of the papers, uh, just uh, check out. Also, both of the faculty presented cases from their practices uh, during these recordings. And it was a really, or these are really great sessions that I know you're going to get a lot out of. So we're going to start today with a couple introductory comments, and then we're going to dive in talk about first-line therapy, second-line and beyond, and then new strategies. So, uh, Terry, uh, I was mentioning that we have this melanoma conference coming up, and I was looking through the slides from Dr. Lipson from Hopkins, and I see this study looking at uh, adjuvant Pembro in melanoma, plus or minus, and it had a bunch of numbers there, and I see it's a randomized phase two, uh, so, you know, we need a phase three, but has a rate of 0.56 for progression. So I'm like, well, what did they add to the Pembro? And that's what was super interesting. Because uh, I don't know if you remember uh, a company by the name of Moderna. Well, it, uh, here they are. Here they are. Uh, this is an RNA vaccine. I do not understand how, what they, how, how they do it or what they do, but the bottom line is they target 34 neoantigens. Um, it's individualized to the patient, and it's, quote, an RNA vaccine, although it seems a very different than a lot of vaccines uh, we've heard about. We could, I just wanted to let the audience know about it. I, I don't know if I'm the last one to hear about this study. Everybody knows about it or not, but I was just stunned when I uh, saw this thing, and maybe people smarter than I am can understand how it works. So I don't want to spend a lot of time. I just want to alert you all to it. We'll talk about it in the webinar. But Terry, any thoughts about this? Of course, immunotherapy has become so critical. You reviewed that in your talk. Any thoughts about, you know, we're at constantly trying to add stuff to PD-1 inhibitors. Any thoughts about this kind of strategy? 
Yeah, I think this is a pretty interesting strategy. You know, most of the immunotherapy that's already approved is is not a personalized immunotherapy. It might be a checkpoint inhibitor, and we're trying to understand who's going to respond and who isn't. And this type of strategy is is actually a little more interesting because they take tumors, they sequence them, they try and identify what's mutated or what's different about the cancer, and then mimic that structure, create that structure as an mRNA, and then give it back to the patient in a way to stimulate the immune system to essentially go hunt for those antigens. Um, and, you know, uh, we've seen some success with that strategy. I think this is probably one of the more successful um, strategies. There's, there's data out there that suggests that using mRNA as the um, vehicle for the vaccine is better than just using a protein, for example, or like a dead piece of cancer. Um, so obviously, you know, it's it, we need to learn more about this. And as you say, we need to see it in bigger in bigger cohorts. But this is a couple hundred patients in this one one study in melanoma. Um, so if it's successful there, maybe it's successful in bladder cancer. Maybe it's successful across solid tumors. Um, but it, it you know obviously needs to be evaluated. Yeah, I mean, the melanoma people have always led the way in terms of immunotherapy. Petrus, any thoughts? I know, I guess Moderna originally was targeting cancer. Then COVID came along. They took their technology and applied it there. But uh, I was just excited because, you know, they could figure out COVID. I'm a little bit more optimistic about this possibility. Any thoughts? Neil, I agree with you. It's very exciting and very interesting. I agree that uh, Moderna as a company was working on cancer vaccines using mRNA technology to try to get in the front of immunotherapy and stimulate the immune system against, as Terry mentioned, cancer-specific new antigens using this personalized approach. And when the COVID-19 pandemic happened, the emergency phase, they pivoted, they switched uh, to developing the COVID vaccine. So the work they had done on the cancer vaccine actually paved the way to develop the Moderna uh, COVID-19 vaccine. I think it's, the technology is very promising. The data, early data that we saw from the pancreatic cancer definitely captured the attention. Uh, it's a good signal. It's a good promising study. It definitely requires further investigation. It's not ready for prime time, but I share your enthusiasm. And there are other companies too that actually take this approach. So we may see actually more than one of those vaccines being developed. And I think the adjuvant setting is an interesting one because of the concept that immunotherapy, especially the vaccine immunotherapy, might in theory potentially work better in the MRD, minimal residual disease scenario. So I think more to come and more trials are being designed in that context. So I uh, wanted to ask you about another thing, and I saw another email from ASCO this morning. With the, you know, When we were at ASCO, we did, I think, 10 programs at ASCO, and at every single one of them, docs were asking about chemotherapy shortage. So uh, I saw this this morning, and I know it's been circulating around, uh, really some great advice in there in general. But what I wanted to ask you about is what they specifically say about bladder cancer. And also as a way to start to get into, you know, one of the main questions I have for you, which is what is the current and future role of EV Pembro? But in any event, uh, first, uh, maybe, uh, you know, here again, we, I just picked, you know, if you look at the uh, ASCO thing, uh, they go through adjuvant, new adjuvant, et cetera. I just picked out first line therapy because we're talking about it. And also, because I was very curious, you know, you don't really have a non-chemotherapy option in a lot of the other cancers. They're like, what do you, we, last night we were talking about uh, endometrial cancer, like, you know, oh, you need carbo, you need carbo for ovary and lung, et cetera. But you guys have one other thing that, of course, is very interesting, and uh, Terry reviewed this in his talk, and we'll talk a little bit about that, which is a non-chemotherapy option of uh, EV uh, Pembro. Uh, so before I get into that, Terry, what is the situation at your place in terms of chemo shortage? Is it just carbo? Is it more cis? And what are you doing? Yeah, so so here at UCSF, we have shortages, unfortunately, of both. And it's a, it's a major problem, not just in bladder cancer, but just across oncology, because platinum, I think of as the sort of the mainstay of how we treat people with chemo. Um, it varies. Like initially, um, we had a cisplatin shortage, and then actually there was enough cisplatin, but then we had a carboplatin shortage. And now they're both in somewhat short supply. So we have committee that like, uh, you know, adjudicates who should be getting this if, if we run into really short supplies. Um, but it's a big, big problem. And as you said, fortunately in bladder cancer, we have this new regimen, this infortimab, bedotin, and pembrolizumab, which doesn't involve any platinum and looks pretty good. And we'll talk about that more in a, in a little bit. Um, so that's potentially helpful, you know, for some of our patients, but it's, it's really, it's really unfortunate. It's really dire in many respects. Um, 
because you know patients who need this, for example, germ cell tumor patients, there's no substitute for platinum and actually for cisplatin, they really need that. Um, so it's we need to fix this problem. I know there's a lot of attention being paid to it at, at the levels of government, et cetera, but it's, it's really a challenge. Any uh, comments? What's going on at the, the Hutch there in terms of chemo? And what about all the people? Are the people sending you patients who they can't give chemo to, for example? Neil, great question. Thank you for raising this issue. It's a national emergency and crisis for sure, as Terry and you mentioned. Uh, and we appreciate the ASCO uh, guidelines as a guide to help us, you know, uh, and community practice, academic practice to deal with this issue. And of course, the advocacy they do, uh, you know, in the, in the policy level, how we can deal with the manufacturing uh, challenges and the business problems. We have direct shortages across uh, uh, the country. Uh, and here at the HATS, uh, so far, we're doing okay in terms of having adequate amounts of uh, those drugs. However, we're trying to be as proactive as possible because if we don't get enough vials down the road, we may get an acute crisis. So proactively, we have an algorithm how we would prioritize if the problem really comes in our front face. Uh, patients with curative intent setting, of course, versus palliative intent, we may prioritize the former. Uh, we talk about uh, patients where they started treatment versus those who may start in the future, uh, about different disease types who may need it more and they may have less attention alternatives, uh, about, talk about clinical trials uh, and how we deal with those situations as well. And as you mentioned, there is a significant amount of patients who may be referred to us from the community centers because they may not have access to coroplatin. This creates a significant challenge because obviously we want to help every single patient in an equitable manner across the board, but it gets very challenging as you can imagine when we have a certain amount of cisplatin and carboplatin, how we prioritize those patients. So it's a case-by-case -case scenario and discussion with the community oncologist to help as many patients as we can. So yeah, very difficult and it must be very, very difficult to discuss this with uh, patients, particularly when you're kind of almost in a rationing situation. There's a big article in the New York Times about this, uh, I think it was in the last couple of days as well. But it also made me think a little bit about another question. I'm just gonna pop out there to you when I sort of saw this thing and I looked at it, uh, Terry, because I've kind of been thinking, and we're, we're gonna get into the data and all, and we're gonna show the survey, but I just wanna pick your brain about one other thing that sort of crossed my mind which is I've been sort of focused on EV Pembro in terms of older patients, platinum ineligible, but like what about for this, you know, younger, no comorbidities, cis platinum eligible? Terry, I know there's a, a phase three trial comparing chemo evalumab maintenance to EV Pembro. Um, I, you know, re, what, what that study is gonna show, you know, it's maybe a little bit tricky, but theoretically, do you think right now EV Pembro is a reasonable alternative if you could present it to a healthy patient who's cis eligible? Yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, the data that's been generated with EV Pembro has all, like 100% of it has been in the cisplatin ineligible population. So we know that EV Pembro seems to work pretty well in that group. Response rates are almost 70%. You know, long-term outcomes are good. People are living, you know, um, two or three times as long as they did five, five or 10 years ago, you know, um, when they just had carboplatin available. So we don't have a lot of data in the, in the cisplatin eligible population. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone really knows how it's going to fare in the phase three trial. Will, will EV Pembro look better than cisplatin and gemcitabine and nivelumab? Will it look the same? May it be a little worse? Um, so I, I, you know, I think um, the regimen's now approved in the cisplatin ineligible population. I think if there were a cisplatin shortage, I might jump to using uh, a EV Pembro. Um, I think I'm a little uncomfortable with saying that that providers should just be giving EV Pembro to the cisplatin eligible patients just because there's really not a, a huge amount of data. I think if there was some real contraindication to giving cisplatin, then yes, for sure. Um, you know, will one be better? I really don't know. It's 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 probably not totally wrong. Like I'm sure patients will do well who are cisplatin eligible who get EV Pembro if that happens. But if we have cisplatin available, if the shortage isn't that that dire, then the the standard recommendation, level one NCCN, you know, recommendation, is to give cisplatin gemcitabine and evaluate maintenance if they have um, stable disease after the chemo. So that's where I'd stay at least for the time being. Yeah, you know, Petrus, I'm thinking more, I'm not thinking about even recommending it. I'm thinking about more, you know, this happens in oncology, particularly you have a knowledgeable patient. You might have a medical oncologist as a patient who says, look, I know the data and I, I'd rather start with EV Pembro, but it also leads into the question 
of what you would see in a randomized study first in terms of quality of life during first-line therapy. You know, uh, patient-reported outcomes, chemo versus EV, Pembro, and uh, Vivelumab, and also survival. You know, when you kind of then you got to factor in second line and beyond. Uh, any thoughts about what you would see quality of life during the uh, in first line therapy and what you would see survival wise in a, in a study like that, uh, Petrus? Great question, Neil. I think overall, I just want to uh, clarify uh, one more time what Terry mentioned and, and relevant to your question. I think we do not have data yet with uh, EV Pembrone and cisplatin eligible patients. So I think we should stick with what we know. There's a small proportion of patients, about 15%, 1-5%, uh, that may have long-term benefit with cisplatin-based chemotherapy, especially with velumab maintenance. Uh, and we have to see whether that's the case also with Pembrone EV. It's likely the case, the local disease lymph node positive scenarios, not the distant metastasis, but we have to see more data. So I agree with Terry's response. I would consider EV Pembro in cisplatin eligible patients only in three scenarios. If you really have a cisplatin shortage, if you have uh, a, a really a patient who refuses chemotherapy, uh, regardless of what you say, and uh, despite our recommendation uh, and the detailed discussion, in rare scenarios when you may have a cisplatin allergy or something uh, in the context of the shortage, which is very rare and we don't see that. But back to your great question, Neil, regarding quality of life. I think it's a great point and I'm glad you raised this because I am a, a proponent of having PROs and quality of life patient report outcomes data as an a priori testable hypothesis with a form of statistical plan being tested in randomized phase three trials like EV302, for example. We have to see what the trial shows. When we think about PROs and quality of life, life Neil, in my mind, is two things. It's a, let's say, combination of you know, symptomatic improvement if you get a great response and PEMBRO EV there may have an advantage because you may get rapid response, palliative benefit, symptomatic improvement improvement with Pembroke V, higher chance compared to platinum gemsalabine at the same time, toxicity is not negligible and we'll see data by Terry in a moment that about two thirds of the patients on Pembro EV may have treatment related grade three or higher adverse events that may also impact quality of life. So I think we have to see the data uh, and we may see some categories like cancer-related symptoms and pain and performance status that may improve on, early on with Pembro EV, and we may see some issues like neuropathy, things like skin toxicity that may impact the other categories of the PRO. So, excellent point and looking forward to the V302 data. Actually, that's a great point you made, though, about uh, the response of the tumor. I'm not sure everybody's aware that the response rate looks like it's higher with EV Pembro than chemo. Chemo, is that correct, uh, Terry? And also, what are your thoughts? You know, it's one thing that, you know, sometimes patient reported outcomes, I see it, I understand it, looks great, pain, whatever. Sometimes I can't figure it out at all. And then I just turn to you all and I say, tell me, what do you see? You know, what's your experience for people uh, more comfortable in, putting aside the issue of responding to the tumor, which I think is a great point. Yeah. So Terry, any comments about this issue yeah, of so greater response rate and also quality of life? Yeah, definitely the response rate in the EV103 trial, as I mentioned, in the two different cohorts was 65 and, and 73%, which is pretty pretty high for urothelial cancer. In fact, older studies of carboplatin-based regimens had only about a 36% response rate. So it's almost a doubling of the response rate. Um, to the PRO question, we actually had PROs that, that uh, we presented at uh, ASCO, a PRO uh, poster, and we have a manuscript that's like being submitted, I think, this week. Um, which looked at the outcomes. These were tracked, you know, prospectively in the patients getting EV and Pembro together. And I think the big take-home point was that you saw that in the at the end of the first cycle, a lot of symptoms actually got worse. You know, patients were more fatigued. Um, they were not feeling sort of as robust, things like that. And that's the effect of the chemo, you know, the EV itself. Um, but then by cycle two, they started getting better. And then if you look at the overall shape of the curve, it was sort of a dip and then a rise. And by the end of you know six cycles or eight cycles or beyond, patients were feeling much better than they were at diagnosis, or for the most part, feeling better. And you know you have to sort of dig into the to the data. But um, so I think that there is something to be said for for having a good anti cancer response, getting the the symptoms under control. And you know in three hundred two, uh, you know it'll be it'll be helpful to look at PROs there as well and see for people who are getting platinum versus EV. You know is there a big difference here? I'm, I'm hoping there is, but we'll have to see. I'm just going to bring up a, another point. Again, we'll get to it later, assuming we can get beyond this. I'm getting, I know, carried away here. But 
When you think about the kind of algorithms we've seen, Petrus, uh, of, you know, chemotherapy, uh, Evalumab maintenance, uh, or, you know, IO uh, initially, for example, uh, I'm just kind of curious, uh, you know, often people think about uh, using Enfortimab as the next line of therapy, but what about the patient who's not had an IO? Uh, would you use an IO or would you want to bring in PEM, uh, EV earlier so you get the combination? Any thoughts about when or if you ever do that? Great question. We published a couple of manuscripts recently. We have a database uh, looking at patients who got checkpoint inhibitor for metastatic urothelial cancer. And we have about 26 institutions from mainly from US, a few from Europe. And we try to answer practical questions using this database. Obviously, these are retrospective data with sort of caveats and selection bias, confounding biases, limitations. But what we saw in the first paper, uh, we saw that patients who had upfront early primary progression to platinum-based chemotherapy, like short time to progression on platinum, usually they do not do well with single agent checkpoint inhibitor second line. So they are not getting salvaged by Pembro second line if they progress early on platinum. So this may be the patients I would probably prioritize either in fortumab or a dafitinib. And we can talk about which of the two or such tuzumab down the road. We'll talk about the sequence. But the other patients are those with visceral metastasis, like liver meds, lung meds, even bone meds. Those patients do not do well with checkpoint inhibitor alone, especially after progression on platinum. So I have actually changed my practice nil over the time, and I tend to use it in fortumab or a dafitinib in select patients based on the biomarker or a clinical trial, of course, uh, in patients with progression of platinum. So I actually, uh, in those patients where I just discussed, visceral metastasis, early progression of platinum, I'm using checkpoint inhibition later on, and I prioritize in fortumab or sastuzumab or dafitinib before checkpoint inhibitor in those patients. The big question is, do you use EV pembro combination in patients with platinum, up from platinum refractory disease who never get maintenance avelumab? And I think it's a reasonable approach the data we have seen from EV103 that Terry will show, it's all in the frontline setting. Interestingly enough, the FDA gave accelerated approval of Pembro EV in cisplatin ineligible patients, but did not specify the line of therapy. So if I have a patient with really explosive disease with liver meds, on, you know, in the front of platinum-based chemo, and I'm really worried about I have one shot on goal, in that patient I may consider extrapolating from the VO03 data and potentially giving EV Pembro second line in those platinum refractory patients. So as you can see, we're really oriented, and as opposed to your two presentations that just go through voluminous data, we're I'm oriented tonight about what you do in practice. Here's where we're gonna head over the next few minutes, particularly to go through the survey. Just, to remind you too that in our primary target audience is a general medical oncologist in a community-based setting, same people taking care of CLL, myeloma, you name it. I was just flashing on a, uh, I was doing a session with a general medical oncologist. I do this where they present all these different cases and then we plug them into very series and we we're talking about bladder cancer and I said, you have any questions you'd like to hear faculty discuss? She goes, uh, well, yeah, I'd like to hear about Enfortimab, Vidotin, you know, what the response rate is, tolerability, et cetera. I say, okay, anything else? Well, I'd like to hear about sasituzumab in bladder cancer. I've used it in breast, but I've never used it in my bladder. I'm curious about that. Anything else? Well, what about ertafitinib? You know, what kind of, you know, she asked me about that. And then I just thought about it for a second. I said, have you used any of those drugs? No. <laughs> So this happens yeah. all the time. The general medical oncologists are using a drug for the first time. They're not going to use it again for a year, but they got to know what to do. Uh, and that's why we're focused on what you're doing in your practice and what really happens. I don't have to, I don't know if you want to comment on this, uh, Terry. This is a slide you showed at the beginning of your talk. But, you know, so many slides, we see some, we saw the same thing last night with endometrial cancer. So many slides about nothing happening for 20 years and then yes. all of a sudden... Last yeah, exactly. night we were There's talking about explosion. I, right. Yeah. So yeah, last night we were talking about incidentally that finally two phase three trials, both positive, IO plus uh, chemo, first line therapy of endometrial, just came out three weeks ago. Fantastic. And again, everything's everything stacked to the right in endometrial as well, yeah. antibody drug conjugates, etc. So uh, Terry, can you take a you go through this in detail? But maybe just sort of uh, highlight uh, your vision of uh, sort of the algorithm you have. You know, so many of these people are older and platinum ineligible. When you first hear that you're going to see a patient uh, with metastatic urothelial bladder cancer, what are some of the things you're thinking about? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing I think about if we're talking about systemic therapy is are they fit to get platinum? Are they fit to get um, any platinum or cisplatin? And that's where the first you know choice here. You know, unfortunately, bladder cancer is a disease of the elderly, and sometimes we have very frail elderly folks. They're not eligible for any chemo. And so you can see on the right side of the screen there, pembrolizumab is technically approved if you don't think you can give them any chemo. Um, or putting them in clinical trial or best supportive care. If they're platinum eligible, meaning cis or carbo, then we in bladder cancer have prospective guidelines that tell us whether someone should get cisplatin. And, and broadly, it's do they have bad neuropathy? Do they have bad hearing loss? Do they have bad renal function? And actually, that's on the slide right here at the bottom, or heart failure or poor performance status. If they have you know, those uh, metrics of you know, then they should not be getting cisplatin because outcomes are poor. So as of today in 2023, if someone's eligible for cisplatin, we should give it. And actually, if you go back to the last slide, when we um, take someone in that blue box who's cisplatin ineligible, we just had this EV Pembro data, which we've been talking about, and you can see it was just approved in April. Um, and this is a choice now. They've not been compared head to head. At least the data has not been published. That's that's the the, the subject of the phase three trial, the EV302 study that we're all waiting for. So you can either give carboplatin, gemcitabine, and avelumab maintenance for patients who have stable disease or better, or give EV Pembro. And I don't think there's a right answer. Um, I do like the idea of giving the immunotherapy on day one. You know, you get the immunotherapy in and you capture patients. We know in urothelial cancer that about a quarter of patients never get frontline therapy. They're just too sick. They have access issues, they have barriers. They never get treated for metastatic disease. And after the first line, about 50% of people never get to the second line. And so that slide we had even before where we saw like nine new drugs, I think the, the, the movement in the field now is to collapse these, these, these regimens together to do combination therapy. And that's really what we're seeing with um, EV Pembro. Um, and so that's sort of how I'm approaching frontline, the frontline of bladder cancer, at least today. So any comments? I was just thinking, what, you need to change that algorithm to carbo not available, cis and carbo not available, you know, break the whole thing out. Can you imagine the algorithm there? But really, we kind of need it, hopefully, not too long. Any comments on the issue of cis uh, ineligibility and platinum ineligibility? I know that's a little bit less defined. Petrus, uh, how do you approach that issue? And particularly, who do you call platinum ineligible, both cis and carbo? Great question, Neil. So I agree that Terry mentioned since platinum eligibility have been mainly based on the GALSI criteria. There's some variability based on the kidney function, the GFR, renal function, we may have different cutoffs. Uh, for example, creatinine clearance of 50 cc per minute or higher may be adequate for me, but others may want to go up to 60. Some other people may go lower to 40 or higher. So there's some variability in, in what threshold of GFR you use for kidney, for cisplatin in, across uh, different providers. Uh, with hydration, maybe still dose cisplatin. The other question is the hearing loss, which may be a little bit of discussion with the patient. Is it a curative intent versus palliative intent of therapy? Therapy, how does hearing factor in? Does the patient have really worry about it or not? So all these factors may be some variations on the GALSI criteria. Now, the platinum, which is platinum and carboplatin together, a fitness eligibility criteria, it's a little bit different. And Dr. Silpa Gupta from Cleveland Clinic led the consensus-based survey. 60 of us go together and we try to answer a survey, similar to the surveys that you uh, do so well, uh, Neil. And we try to come up with some consensus of who are the patients who we are not feeling comfortable giving even carboplatin. So cis and carbo, so-called platinum ineligible patients. And what we came up with was a creatinine clearance below 30 ml per minute, even gemcitabine can be tricky with low that low GFR. Uh, patients with ECOG PS of three, patients with ECOG PS of two plus, uh, GFR below 30, patients with peripheral neuropathy grade two or higher uh, because of the talents with uh, uh, neuropathy with carboplatin uh, in some patients and patients with symptomatic heart failure. And those factors, if you add them together, it's probably up between 10, maybe 15, one five percent of patients in my practice meet those criteria that are not platinum uh, fit and may end up getting pembrolizumab alone uh, in my practice. Um, if I have a clinical trial, that would be a great option. It's a hard population to accrue. The big question, of course, is would we envision any patient who meet this criteria that someone would give Pembro EV, maybe those adjusted versus Pembro alone. And I think that's an unanswered question and depends on the degree of comfort uh, of the providers and the patient's preference. 
So if you want to hear something kind of humorous, the oncologist that I was just talking about is in the chat room tonight, and she just sent me a smiley face. So thanks a lot. Anyhow, <laughs> all right, let's talk a little bit about EV, and particularly EV Pembro. Uh, anything you want to say, uh, uh, Terry? You know, when you said you know chemo side effects, I guess it's a reminder. You know, I think of antibody drug conjugates, you know, as uh, targeted therapy, but more and more, I think, particularly with the uh, uh, TDXD, for an example, and HER2 positive, we see a lot of chemo side effects. So yeah. I guess it is important to remember that we are delivering uh, chemotherapy. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, the EV uh, Pembro data. Uh, I don't want, again, your talk goes through all the different uh, studies. Maybe you could just sum- summarize where we are and where you think we're going to be in the next year or two, Terry, with this combination. Sure. Sure. Just to your point about EV, EV as a, a chemo versus targeted therapy, I call it chemotherapy. I'm very upfront about that because I think it's better that patients are expecting side effects, even though it's exciting and it's new and it, you know maybe it's better. We'll see. Um, I think it's just setting the the table and calling it calling it chemotherapy is helpful in many respects. So, um, so the EV103 study, you know, was designed because there was some evidence that when you give EV, at least to cells in a in a culture, there's actually immunogenic cell death. The immune cells infiltrate the tumor, and um, you know, then and sort of EV somehow drives that. And so that was the rationale for combining it with pembrolizumab. Um, and so EV103, the study you have, you have posted here, was a multi-arm study where there were multiple different cohorts. And the one that's really been um, most examined is EV and Pembro together. So there was this cohort A that our colleague, Dr. Gupta, just presented at ASCO as well um, and has now been published. And, and this was the dose sort of dose finding, you know, initial cohort. What we saw was when you give these two drugs together, you get a 73% response rate. And I think that really kind of knocked our socks off um, because no one was expecting response rates that high. We know with EV alone, it's about 45% response rate. Um, So when you combine, when you add it with the Pembro, it's certainly additive in terms of the benefit. And I think one of the major questions is, is it synergistic? Is it like one plus one equals three here? You know, we're getting more benefit by giving them concurrently than we would if we just gave them in sequence. Um, The other important thing here is that we saw 15% complete response rate. We saw less than 10% of patients had primary resistance or progressive disease there, or just about 10%. Um, And then in terms of the longer term effects, um, we saw the median an OS of over two years. And I mentioned this earlier, there was a phase three trial of carboplatin and gemcitabine in this basically the same population 10 years ago. Median OS was nine months. So we're seeing a tripling, at least in a small cohort here, of the median OS with this regimen. And it just shows you how powerful you know, some of these new therapies really are. Um, and because of that cohort A, um, a larger cohort was designed and we carried out this study. We did a randomized cohort where we looked at EV plus Pembro and compared it to EV alone in the frontline setting in the same patient population. Um, the EV alone was to get a sense of what the toxicity profile of EV by itself is and what this combo toxicity profile is. But otherwise, the regimen was almost identical. Um, and we put about 140 patients between the two arms. And as you can see from this waterfall plot, you know, almost every patient had some degree of tumor shrinkage on the um, initial scans. Um, the median time to response is short. It's like on the order of two months. So basically, at the first imaging, you generally see a response. And that's really helpful. Um, And then when we looked at the longer term outcomes in terms of survival, they basically mirrored cohort A. So we're um, actually technically the median survival has not been met after 18 months of follow up. But, you know, based on what we're seeing, I think it's going to track very closely with what we've seen already with cohort A. Um, So overall, it was really encouraging that that the numbers kind of held up in cohort K of this of this study. And that's really what drove the FDA approval was seeing, you know, real activity in a in a decent number of patients. So, Petrus, I'd like you to take a look at a couple of the questions we asked the faculty. I was going to say there was a consensus about first-line therapy. Then I just noticed that Betsy Plimick says Pembro rather than Avelumab. That's kind of interesting. But I call this generally a consensus, at least in terms of uh, the strategy. Also, the, that uh, PD-1 is not a factor in making uh, the decision. We also asked about uh, an 80-year-old patient who's not a candidate for cisplatin. Uh, but it's interesting. Most people say Pembro EV, but a couple people say they, in an 80-year-old, they would still try a Carbo a gem followed by Velumab. Any thoughts about uh, first-line therapy, uh, Betsy's uh, preference uh, 
for Pembro and particularly the 80-year-old uh, Petrus? Neil, great scenarios. So uh, I think overall uh, there was a consensus, as you mentioned, for sustained eligible patients. Uh, people would use GEMSYS uh, and those with response or stable disease switch maintenance available based on the Javelin Bladder 100 trial with prolonged overall survival and progression free survival. Uh, in terms of the pembrolizumab as a switch maintenance immunotherapy, there was a phase two trial by the Hoosier Cancer Research Network published by Dr. Galski and colleagues, and that actually uh, showed the PFS benefit with pembrolizumab. It was a smaller trial, 107 patients, significant PFS, but there was no overall survival benefit. So uh, I personally think it's important to stick with the level one evidence and go with this trial that showed the OS benefit that was a javelin by the 100. Therefore, I have been using Avelumab um, uh, and it seems like uh, for other colleagues do the same thing. Obviously, Avelumab is given every two weeks uh, and is given until progression or an acceptable toxicity. So it's a significant Significant treatment burden for the patient, and I think Dr. Plima has a great point there that this treatment burden, you know, is relevant. Uh, we have no good data about longer intervals for the volume of doses, so we're kind of stuck in that two-week interval. Could we potentially do it less frequently? You could envision extrapolating and patients who may need to go for a trip, you know, have some social engagement. But technically, we, we try to use uh, Avelumab uh, uh, and, and then Pembro uh, can be used again in very rare scenarios. Someone has a very rare significant infusion reaction, for example, with Avelumab, usually those are mild to moderate. You could potentially switch to Pembro. But uh, I understand what I said here point is mainly the treatment frequency, especially if Pembro can be given every three or six weeks. Uh, having said that, I think majority of us give a value map in that setting. In terms of the cisplatin ineligible patient, eight year old gentleman uh, we, uh, with the option of Carbogem followed by Velumab or Pembro EV, as Terry mentioned before, I think either option is very reasonable. We have level one evidence with Carbogem followed by Velumab. People are familiar with toxicity profile. Uh, they know how to manage those patients, kind of predictable to a degree. Uh, it, so it's manageable. Having said that, I think especially patients who need the response right away, visceral metastasis, uh, explore Disease, symptomatic disease, uh, carboplatin shortage, all of those factors may make you choose Pembro EV. And, and because the majority of patients had visceral metastasis, that's why I think at least four out of six uh, choose Pembro EV in that setting. Uh, but I can envision patients who may choose either or. Uh, and it needs, needs an informed and shared decision making uh, with the patient. So uh, before we go on to second line therapy, one other question slash thought to you, uh, Terry. One of the things we see, and you know, it's pretty clear in lung cancer, but a lot of the other solid tumors, maybe not quite so, there's not as many patients, it's hard to say. But clearly you do see some people who get IO alone, and you know, two years later they're free of disease, you're trying to decide whether to stop it or not. You presented an incredible case uh, during your presentation, Terry, I think a 76-year-old woman with uh, Parkinson's in terrible shapes, this huge tumor. She's in CR, I think three years, uh, later. And I think there's this feeling that if there's going to be a home run, it's going to be from the IO, or at least the likelihood is. And like last night, we were arguing and talking about, should you use the IO with chemo first line or wait? Because they've been using it second line. And one of the points that uh, Brad Monk brought up is, quote, you want to get your best drug in first. But I think what he, what he, I think what he was trying to say is, if you're going to see a home run, it's going to be with an IO. And therefore, he wanted, even though maybe in the long run, I don't, maybe this trial wouldn't show a survival benefit, but kind of looking for the home run. Any thoughts? Is that a reality in uh, urothelial bladder cancer, Terry? Yeah, I mean, there are patients who respond to single-agent checkpoint inhibitor and have dramatic responses. I have a number of them, and they're, I follow up with them five, six, seven years later. That one with Parkinson's brought her, you know, like three-month-old granddaughter into the clinic right. three years after, after diagnosis. I thought she was going to die within months when I first met her. Um, so the question today is, is there still a role for single agent IO? I think the challenge is certainly in bladder cancers, we have no good biomarker to tell us who that woman is. You know, when the next patient walks in the door, is, is that patient going to respond to a single agent checkpoint inhibitor? There's certainly less toxicity giving IO monotherapy compared to EV Pembro. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's this huge step off with every line of therapy in bladder cancer. So if we put barriers in front of patients and say, no, you have to start with platinum and then only then can you get a checkpoint inhibitor, you know, we end up losing patients who, who never, for whatever reason, never make it. So I think there's a lot of rationale to be using sort of as just like we were saying with your colleague or guest last night, you know, the best foot forward. 
And, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think if I saw that same woman now who, you know, today and we had Evie Pembro, would I have given her just checkpoint monotherapy? I might not have. You know, she had really ugly looking cancer. I probably would have given her both. And then I would be out here being like, wow, Evie Pembro works so well. So, you know, unless we do our head to head study, we're never going to know for sure. I don't think we're ever going to do a head to head study of IO mono versus anything else in bladder cancer because we have a good sense of how IO monotherapy works. Um, I wish we had better biomarkers. You know, I wish we had something that could tell us very clearly who's going to respond and who doesn't. PDL1 works in lung cancer, it works in head and neck cancers, it really doesn't seem to work well in bladder cancer. There have been multiple phase three trials that just don't sh or show that the PDL1 biomarker is not enough to discriminate between who's going to respond and who isn't. So when I was talking about getting the INO early, I wasn't necessarily talking about monotherapy. I was getting back no. to my original question earlier about EV Pembro, that you're getting the Pembro right away, whereas when you go chemo, Evalumab, I don't even know. I think a fair amount of people don't even get to Evalumab because they're right. progressing. Right, so exactly. Are, then so, do they get, and then do they get it second line, and what kind of shape are they in at that point? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, that's why I think there's a, a rationale you know, to be giving the IO earlier. And as I mentioned earlier too, there may be some synergy, right? One plus one might equal three by giving them together. Um, we don't know that for sure, but that's clearly like, you know, of interest. Um, so I, I like the idea of you have the patient in front of you, you're about to give them treatment, give them the treatment, you know, get the IO in. Obviously we need the phase three data to be sure that that's the right way to go. But that's why, you know, my, my response on that last slide was to give EV Pembro over carbo, carbo, you know, based therapy. So, Petrus, let's talk a little bit about the other antibody drug conjugate that's approved in the bladder cancer. I'm always bragging about bladder cancer. You're the only ones with two antibody drug, con I think. Well, her two positive breast cancer, that doesn't count. But uh, anyhow, so, and speaking of breast cancer, of course, most docs have experience with sasituzumab uh, in breast cancer. Very successful drug. I mean, it works in breast cancer. You have to deal with tolerability issues, but... Uh, that seems okay. Uh, can you chat a little bit about what we know about uh, what Joyce O'Shaughnessy calls SASE uh, in bladder cancer, Petrus? Thanks, Neil. You know, I remember early days when we were starting about developing this drug uh, back about uh, five years ago. And uh, I think from the beginning there was enthusiasm about the mechanism of action. As you saw in this slide, this an antibody drug conjugate is different than Enfortumab in, in many ways. Number one, different target. This is TROP2 versus Nectin4. It's a different linker that can be hydrolyzed and this can release the payload, even the tissue microenvironment. And people are wondering whether this may or not have to do with the efficacy of the drug, bystander effect, hard to tell. The payload is a SN38 and very active metabolite of renotecan, so a toposomerase 1 inhibitor. This drug showed a very interesting activity early on in a phase one trial that Dr. Tagao, Dr. Faltas led, and the response rate was 31% in patients with prior therapies, so definitely a very impressive response rate comparing favorable with historical controls. That led to uh, a, a, a very uh, uh, a relevant phase two trial called the Trophy U01 uh, that had multiple cohorts. Uh, cohort 1, 2, and 3 have been presented. Cohort 4, 5, and 6 are ongoing in the frontline setting. And cohort 1, single agent satituzumab govitecan, uh, after prior therapies, after chemotherapy, after checkpoint inhibition, this trial allowed any number, unlimited number of prior therapies, multiple predicted patients, and uh, showed a response rate of 28% with SATSI alone. Uh, in this heavily predicted population, the median, uh, as you see, duration of response was about five to six months in that cohort one, uh, median PFS about five months and uh, median OS approaching 11 months, obviously single arm phase two trial. The FDA gave accelerated approval to this drug based on the phase two data with a contingency at the phase three trial, which by the way, it's called Tropics 04, uh, taxane or vinflunin in the control group versus SATSI, which has finished accrual results are pending, would be done. And that trial is ongoing now. Uh, at the same time, we have very quickly uh, to mention some data in the second line space, a single uh, uh, therapy, monotherapy uh, of satituzumab in patients who had progression on uh, a checkpoint inhibitor frontline. They got Pembro or Atizio frontline. They had progression, cisplatin ineligible patients. They got uh, SATSI second line, 32% response rate. Uh, so promising. Um, uh, the 
the drug has no uh, FDA approval in this second line space, post checkpoint inhibitor, but this activity about a third of the patients. And the, what you saw in this slide here is the cohort three that I had the chance to present at ASCO GU 2022 and 2023. This is Pembro plus Sachi combination. This is platinum refractory population. They never got available maintenance and they have platinum refractory disease. We discussed earlier that these patients do not do well with IO alone. The combination looks pretty active, 41% uh, response rate. Uh, with a combination with longer follow-up. It met the primary endpoint, and right now we're discussing about a phase three trial with Pembro plus uh, in, uh, uh, in previous disease. So more to come. Toxicity profile, of course, is a little bit different. Neutropenia, growth factor support is very important as primary prophylaxis. Diarrhea can happen with many patients. Uh, fatigue, GI side effects. One of the things you mentioned in your talk uh, was the issue of UGT1A uh, assays or any situations where you actually do that in patients getting sasituzumab. I don't remember hearing people bring that up in breast, but I think it's a very good point. It's a great question, uh, Neil. So we saw some data at ASCO, Johan Lorio saw the data just a month ago, and we will look at the uh, treatment-related adverse events uh, in patients with a wild status of the UCD1A1 or heterozygous or homozygous status for the allele that may impact the metabolism of uh, uh, SN38, the metabolite of Irnotican. And if you have the homozygous allele that is in, involved in less metabolism, you may have more drug floating around, less breakdown of the drug, and in theory, more toxicity. Uh, we saw some numerical differences. Those patients with the homozygous allele that is uh, impacting the function of UCD1, uh, they have higher uh, uh, risk of uh, uh, adjustment of the dose of SATSI, dose reductions or dose uh, uh, holds or discontinuations. However, because of the frequency of the uh, homozygous allele and the totality of the data uh, in urothelial cancer, we do not check UGT1A1. So for the practicing oncologists out there, there is no practical need to test for UGT1A1. However, if you see an out of proportion toxicity, significant neutropenia despite growth factor or those adjustments or significant diarrhea, I think it's reasonable to send that because it might potentially give you some heads up about toxicity of the drug. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned before, in my opinion, it's very important to use growth factor GCSF as a primary prophylaxis up front from, from the beginning, from the, the first cycle of those, for those patients with such tuzumab. So, uh, Terry, I'd like your thoughts on sasituzumab. I showed the graphic that shows uh, investigators generally using enfortimab first. I think that people think there's more data. I'd be curious to know what you think we're going to be doing in the future. Also, quality of life sasituzumab versus enfortimab. We asked here about uh, the uh, faculty's experience with dose reduction uh, with sasituzumab, and you can see uh, it's uh, substantial, but... Um, kind of like all over the place. Uh, what's yeah. your experience with uh, sasituzumab, and uh, do you think ultimately it's going to be uh, sort of lined up with enfortimab, or is enfortimab always going to be before it? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. They were developed, at least at the beginning, kind of at the same time, there was a development hold on sasituzumab for about a year, and that allowed EV to sort of generate more data. And I think, you know, EV got an approval before SASI did, um, and so that sort of put EV ahead of sasituzumab in most of the treatment paradigms. You know, when you look at the monotherapy response rate, you, you know, EV looks a little better. And, you know, it's cross-trial comparison. There's a lot of issues with doing that. But EV was about 45%. Sasituzumab is more around 30%. Um, so, you know, is one drug better than the other? You know, we'll probably never see a head-to-head -head study of these two. Um, in fact, there's a study at Dana-Farber that's combining the two in the same patient. So maybe they'll just be friends and we'll end up giving both. I mean, we have to see how that study looks. Um, but so I, I have a feeling that what we're seeing is we have sort of three pillars now, or maybe four. We have EV, we have Pembro, we have Platinum, and now we have Sastituzumab. And I think, you know, EV may bubble up to the top if 302 is positive, and people who progress despite EV Pembro then might be good candidates for SASE or for carboplatin or, you know, potentially cisplatin-based therapies in the second line. I think we need to see more data. You know, the data, even though SASE has been around for a long time, approved in breast cancer, New England Journal paper, like we actually have very limited data in bladder. You know, the, the initial studies that Dr. Grievous was just talking about are, you know, double digits, you know, one or two of them are maybe a little bigger, 
but we really need to see the Tropics 04 study and really see how it performs in the third line setting. And I think that'll inform us as to like really where SASE fits. I give it, I give it after progression of, of EV Pembro and generally after Platinum. I actually have a patient who's responding to it. I'm seeing him tomorrow and he's thrilled. So it really does have a role. He actually didn't respond to EV. And so I think trying to understand biomarkers, who's going to respond, who's not. I mean, there's so many questions there. So. So, yeah, uh, and actually interesting question in the chat room from Andrew uh, Petros. He says, uh, I do so much chemo radiation for elderly patients who decline surgery for muscle invasive disease. These patients are clearly high risk for progression. Are there trials evaluating the addition of IO or ADCs or chemo R after chemo RT? That's a great question. Thanks to Andrew for asking. So there have been uh, some phase two trials data, very promising, evaluating the role of checkpoint inhibitor. For example, pembrolizumab, we saw data of ASCO 2023 a month ago uh, by NYU uh, that showed that gemcitabine plus pembrolizumab plus radiation has a very promising disease control rate for muscle invasive localized disease. However, for now, we're waiting for phase three trial data before we use checkpoint inhibitor for chemo radiation in bladder preservation. Uh, the one trial that comes to mind is the SWOG NRG 1806, 1806 chemo RT plus minus Atizo. There's also the Keynote 992 chemo RT plus minus Pembro. Both trials of chemo RT plus minus checkpoint inhibitor after maximum TURBT. Until those trials read out, the phase three trials, I'm not using checkpoint inhibitor uh, with chemo radiation uh, after uh, TURBT. I'm waiting for the phase three trials. Uh, there are some other trials that are, are looking at uh, ADCs, and uh, I think these are promising, but very early in the development. So for now, the role of checkpoint inhibitor or ADCs remains experimental uh, for blood preservation setting. So Hassan in the chat room wants to hear about Erda Fit, and we're about to get into that here. A couple more questions from the uh, uh, survey related to acetuzumab. Everybody except Betsy uses uh, preemptive growth factors. Betsy's a little bit of a rebel, I guess. Uh, also, what do you do in a situation where a patient gets uh, neutropenic without uh, fever? Uh, most people would hold the SG and restart at a reduced dose. Uh, we also ask, uh, do you use preemptive medication? Terry, you were talking about viewing this as uh, chemotherapy. Same yep. thing with TDXD. You know, they're using preemptive uh, Yep. Uh, GI meds as well. Uh, many are for diarrhea as well. Uh, Terry, can you provide a little bit of an overview of uh, uh, ertafitinib, FGFR mutations, which seem like they're not as common as they were hoped to be, but still a lot of people. I mean, we, we, we have all kinds of treatments uh, for very, very rare disease. There are plenty of people with FGFR bladder, metastatic bladder cancer. Uh, how do you die? How do you uh, pick this up? What kind of assay do you use? And what's your experience with ertafitinib, Terry? Sure. Yeah. So it's exciting that we actually have a targeted therapy that's based on a, a you know mutation or molecular finding in in the tumor, and that's FGFR3. You know, it's a little more common in upper tract tumors um, compared to lower tract tumors, but globally, it's about 20% of cancers, bladder cancers that have these mutations, and they really drive the, the progression of the disease. It's also, by the way, seen in cholangiocarcinoma, where you can see FGFR2 mutations and their FGFR inhibitors approved there as well. Um, so ertafitinib is a pan-FGFR inhibitor. It's one of the first out of the gate. Um, and that was just evaluated. Actually, the data was presented in this phase three trial, the Thor study. And you can see the data here, which showed that when you compare it to chemo, there was about an overall survival of about a year. Um, you know, the response rate was about 45, 46%. So that's pretty good. You know, that's what we see with EV monotherapy. Um, I think what I didn't show on this slide is the, um, the toxicity, the side effects. And I think the challenge is FGFR is important in healthy functioning of your body, specifically in phosphate metabolism. So patients um, have to go on a low phosphate diet when they take ertafitinib, and that can be challenging. Um, there's also hand-foot syndrome. There can be oral ulcers. There can be a lot of other problems and, and actually retinopathy, um, which can be serious. So, you know, when I give this uh, drug, when I find a patient who has this, I tell them it's very, or I think of it very much like TKIs in kidney cancer. You know, it's oral therapy. I kind of call it oral chemotherapy for the same reasons I call you know, um, ADCs chemotherapy, because I really want the patients to understand that this isn't necessarily a walk in the park. 
Um, and so if I have a patient, I think it's great because it offers another line of treatment. I think some unanswered questions, is there synergy with PD-1? There was actually a study presented looking at that and it seemed modest, like maybe there's a modest increase in um, responses when you give it with a PD-1, um, but you know, it wasn't dramatic. Um, and then the other question is, you know, if you have a patient who has an FGFR mutation, should you start with ertafitinib? Should you start with EV? Should you start with platinum? And we have registry data, actually. Our co my colleague here at UCSF, Vadim Koshkin, um, and, and others have led this UNITE registry, which is getting real-world evidence from patients who are treated. We saw that EV um, has about a similar response rate in patients who are FGFR mutated as in patients who aren't. And, you know, so that doesn't that doesn't say that one drug is better or worse. I think both are options. You know, ertafitinib has an advantage of being oral, so patients don't have to come in as much, but there is monitoring. You actually have to adjust the dose based on the phosphate levels. Um, so so that, that does take some handholding um, with ertafitinib. And last thing is that there's actually a number of other FGFR inhibitors in development um, behind ertafitinib that may or may not be approved in bladder in the coming years, hopefully more selective for the FGFR3 and hopefully less toxic. So, yeah, a real uh, challenge to use uh, this agent. Uh, uh, when we ask people, how do you sequence the, the, these three uh, agents uh, post sort of chemo IO uh, approaches, uh, you can see that uh, there's kind of a difference there. Uh, a number of people, including Petrus, want to start with uh, ertafitinib before either the antibody drug conjugates. Others will go with the antibody drug conjugates. Um, also, and this kind of emphasizes uh, your point about the challenge, uh, uh, it looks like a high fraction of patients uh, based on the experience of the investigators do require dose reduction. Any sort of pearls uh, about using ertafitinib uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, Dr. Grievous, uh, in terms of the tolerability? What are sort of the main issues clinically that you run into? That's a great point, Neil, because uh, it's a drug that is ha has high activity. It's an active drug. Patients definitely can have benefit. Uh, response rates can be in the order of 40% or so, and a significant proportion of patients have tum tumor reduction uh, on the scans. At the same time, that activity uh, has to be balanced against the potential side effect profile. So there's a number of logistical points that we need to keep in mind when we prescribe erdafitinib, and we need to think about ophthalmology exams at baseline, and then months in the first four months, and then every three months thereafter, assuming no toxicities that need more frequent ophthalmologic evaluation. And the reason is, as Terry mentioned before, uh, the ertafitinib compound, because of the FGFR targeting, may cause some cornea or retinal toxicity. So a baseline eye exam, a dilated eye exam, with uh, cornea retinal evaluation and uh, OCT uh, is necessary to evaluate those patients at baseline, make sure there's no pathology that we need to know about. And about a quarter of the patients may have some side effect from the eye. Usually it's dry eyes and usually get improved by eye drops, natural tears, sort of uh, speaking. However, it's very important to let the patient know to screen their vision daily. We give them the so-called Amsler grid A-M-S-L-E-R, it's a grid with a vertical and uh, horizontal lines with a black dot in the middle and they look for, you know, sh screen themselves for bloody vision. They can put in their fridge every morning uh, somewhere that they can remember to screen for it. The other issue is, of course, the diet, and uh, Terry mentioned that before. Uh, in a proportion of patients, hyperphosphatemia can happen because you inhibit, you actually, you inhibit the FGFR receptor, so you end up with more reabsorption of phosphorus in the kidney. Uh, so we, uh, at some patients, depending on the phosphorus, phosphorus level, you may end up needing a low phosphorus diet, and depending on the level, if the phosphorus keeps going up despite the diet, you may end up needing phosphate binders uh, with meals to reduce the absorption of the phosphorus in the GI tract. Uh, the other thing is uh, very a, a close uh, attention monitoring of the patient, avoid underreporting uh, of adverse events, bring them in to examine them, uh, because some patients may not report skin toxicities, hand-foot syndrome can be an issue, think about TKIs, nail changes can happen in those patients, stomatitis, mouth sores, so a good physical exam, including all the above is key, along with a very good education of the patient. The other logistical uh, step, uh, Neil, is about two to three weeks after you start the treatment, the starting dose is eight milligrams once a day. This is the starting dose for uh, the uh, indication. You need to, of course, bring the patient in, examine them, ask about any side effects, and check labs because you want to check the phosphorus level. And there is a dose titration. For example, if there is no grade two 
or higher toxicity if there is no eye toxicity at all and the phosphorus level does not exceed 5.5. Based on the package insert and the label, you may up titrate the dose from 8 milligrams to 9 milligrams, which introduce an extra in prescription because the tablet comes uh, 4 milligrams, 3 milligrams, or 5 milligrams. So you have to prescribe a new uh, uh, a prescription for the patient, 4 plus 5 equals 9 milligrams, again, in the absence of, uh, uh, of significant toxicity, as I mentioned, per package insert. So a close attention needs, as you mentioned, you know, someone who has done it before, if not close attention per the package insert to make sure we follow the logistical steps. So a final quick uh, topic. I'm starting to think that uh, HER2 is going to be the new MSI or the new BRAF because I feel like I'm talking about HER2. We were talking about last night with endometrial. A lot of it's because of TDXD, but then all of a sudden, Decidimab Vidotin. I know the last name, but uh, new antibody uh. drug conjugate to HER2. Her uh, Terry, what's this about? I think we have seen actually seeing data Pretty good sure. waterfall plot. What is this agent? Yeah, so decidimabidotin or RC48, it was actually developed in China initially, and it's being um, developed here now in the U.S. with, with CGEN. Um, it's basically the same payload, MMAE, that we use for EV. It's a microtubule stabilizer, but conjugated to essentially an anti-HER2 antibody. You know, there have been a number of trials, sort of smaller studies, looking at um, trastuzumab, looking at uh, TDM1, and looking at TDXD in bladder cancer, and, and HER2 has always been the, sort of the stepchild of bladder cancers. About 15 or 20 percent of bladder tumors are high HER2 expressors, but we've not yet really seen a strong signal by blocking HER2, and you could argue that might be due to some trial design issues. Regardless, in this study, this initial one that you're showing, you can see the waterfall plot looks great. You know, patients are responding, and even patients with, you know, IC, I, I, IHC 3 or 2 plus were responding. Um, so, you know, there's early data here. This is being rolled out in a phase two and now a phase three trial here in the U.S. I think the toxicity profile from what I've seen is similar to what we see with um, EV. And the question is, you know, how important is targeting HER2? And I guess we'll have to see. So, yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, they, pretty good waterfall plot for HER2 1 plus. So, maybe right. we'll see what we're seeing in breast cancer with his HER2 low. With the TDX. Well, we exactly. could go on and on, but uh, we've come to the end of our time. And I think it is just really significant that in an hour, it's just impossible to even cover metastatic disease, let alone urothelial bladder cancer. We've got all these cases in the chat room we're not going to be able to get to, but we'll get to them eventually. Uh, Terry and Petrus, thank you so much uh, for working with us today. Audience, uh, thank you uh, for coming uh, here today. Uh, for your nurses, let them know about our conference next week on CLL. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Terry. Thanks, Petrus. Thank you, Neil. And thank you on. so much, Neil. Thank you.